And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. This is the three-peat of Big Dice panel. <laughs> and with me, I have one, two, three, four good brothers. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, I had. Yes, I had to make a count joke. It's the way this works. <laughs> um, first off, first off, we coming to us all the way from the Undercity. We have the one and only Opti. Hello, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Second, we have the we have the biggest cyberpunk aficionado within the hallowed halls of this temple, the not Florida man, Mark Everglade. Great to be here. Thanks, Mildred. And we have the double-headed monster and the Abbott and Costello of cyberpunk, the wrong <laughs> brothers, Cameron and Colin. Hi, we're happy to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us on, Mildra. Yeah, Pleasure. Happy. So I know I know it's I know it's been a hot few months since I ha since I had you guys on individually. But how are you how have you been doing? I can only well, speak for myself. I've been busy as hell. Uh, Kickstarter is done and manufacturing has started on Gangs of the Undercity. Mm -hmm. so that's basically all I've been spending my entire life doing. Um, well, hopefully you get some time to sleep in, in the interim. Very, very seldom. <laughs> when the kids go to bed, I can start working. <laughs> or, is it, or is it a case of you try and fall asleep and then your brain says, hey, wake up, think about things. Uh, no, by the time I go to bed at like 3 or 4 in the morning, I, I, I hit the I hit the bed pretty hard and, and fall right asleep. I just wake up too early because, you know, again, kids. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, wow. don't do not do cool stuff if you have kids, I guess. That's the moral of the story. <laughs> I lie, but also kind of not. <laughs> Good. Well, we, uh, we just wrapped up our... Uh, our Kickstarter as well. I was looking into nice. uh, your gangs under the other of the underworld Kickstarter. It looks like you guys did a great job. Hopefully, I said it right. Gangs of the Undercity, but yeah, Undercity. Yeah, we, uh, we much better than we than we anticipated. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we uh, survived our Axon Punk expanded Kickstarter. It's the second second um, edition of our uh, hip hop inspired cyberpunk game. And we're really grateful that Mildra had us on to help spread the word. And uh, so, yeah, so now we're kind of processing. And uh, life has been a wild, very cyber cyberpunk realistic world. That's my life these days. <laughs> 2020 is an education and living in weird dystopian times. I think uh, we're all getting a lot of content out of <laughs> what we're living in right now to be honest um, let me off this uh, cyberpunk train please have, well haven't you ever heard the expression life imitates art right <laughs> very much so this is very life imitating art time with 2020 look i'm just i'm just look i'm just looking forward to see to see to seeing you know, you know that you know that in twenty years somebody's gonna somebody's gonna make a comedy parodying this parodying um the entirety of twenty twenty. You know, maybe, maybe we maybe if we get maybe if we get lucky we can get Roland Emmerich to do it to really bullshit science. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked it worked out well for it worked out well for for um to, for twenty twelve and us getting chased by a radioact radiation cloud or some or some other completely nonsensical shit. <laughs> Was it this year? Like earlier on this year, we like there were actually like radioactive bores somewhere, and like as cool as that was, like we've forgotten all about it by now because uh, all the other crazy crap that keeps happening. Look, there, is, there, there, is there is one thing. There is one good thing that came out of 2020. Wiley Coyote finally caught the Roadrunner. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that. <laughs> it was it was an image that buried. got, shit, that got around of, like, <laughs> of a coyote with a bird in his mouth, and everybody's like, "He finally did it! He finally caught that fucking roadrunner!" <laughs> you did it! You finally did it! You son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> but now i i do want to I do want to point out that um, the timing of setting up this day of all days to to uh, do this panel. 
um, is a bit of accidental geniusing, especially since I'm going to be doing something cyberpunk related next Sunday for um, Geek Watch. But <laughs> like, because obviously later this month, Cyberpunk 2077 is co is coming around, and. <laughs> I didn't plan on having on doing this kind of thing in advance to that, but I guess I'll take it. Like I said, accidental genius. Mm -hmm. So, um, after the show, I think I'll head down to catering to feed my ego. <laughs> but well, I am glad that Cyberpunk 2077 is coming out because it is expanding the genre, and I'm glad that they're making another Matrix movie. Um, and Keanu Reeves is actually backing up a lot of good cyberpunk projects at the moment, so I think it's very timely, yeah. to be honest. Um, as far as as far as this whole thing about do, about doing another Matrix movie, um, I have I have to I have to maintain my I have to maintain my age old policy, which is just because you say that you're working on a project means absolute sweet butter all to me. <laughs> Like unless unless I see some unless I see some eye catch art or see an actual trailer, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. Fair enough. Fair enough. Not I'm not saying that the, I'm not saying that a fourth Matrix movie is smoke and mirrors. I'm just saying I need I need to see I need to see some steak. <laughs> I don't I don't take anything for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. <laughs> I mean, look. I made my mistake all those years ago with the no with the notion of uh, of the potent of a potential Sam and Twitch movie in the in Spawn's universe, which never ended up happening. So, yeah, I'm not making that mistake again. But now, when, now, I kind of I kind of touched on this in the past when I had all, when I've had you guys on um, individually, but. What if what would you say it what would you say was the appeal for you and the appeal in general when it comes to cyberpunk? Okay, uh, I guess I will go first on this. Um, for me, cyberpunk really happened. I was born in 1985 and I went to school for photography and I started doing that at about 16 and it was darkroom photography at the time. And I had read cyberpunk books and different things like that growing up, uh, Neuromancer, lots of Gibson. Um, uh, and I enjoyed uh, cyberpunk, but as my degree that I was going for photography got digitized over time, I felt like I was my medium chosen piece of art was being hacked as I was going. Things were dying and falling away, becoming uh, very, very analog or very obsolete very quickly. Um, and new technology was proceeding so fast with new image capture technology. I, I really felt like I had my own fairly cyberpunk experience in that. So that's where some of my personal art feels come from. Mm -hmm. Man, I sort of... Um... <clears throat> fell into it uh, in a weird way in that <clears throat> um, I was <laughs> I was just playing around in a uh, role-playing group with some buddies of mine and we were wrapping up a Dungeons and Dragons campaign and um, somebody said hey I don't want to GM anymore somebody else want to GM so I said sure I'll do it um, and I remember sort of liking Shadowrun from back in the day when I used to play it when I was a, a, a younger guy. And so I started looking into um, the the Shadowrun lore and the Shadowrun universe and started getting ready to, to start that game. And I realized it's a little bit of an involved story, so I apologize ahead of time. But I started looking around uh, for how to get into that universe because there's a lot of lore into it. And there wasn't uh, a real easy way to to break into that. So I started a podcast about the lore of the Shadowrun universe. And in order to do so, I had to create a sort of persona. Um, the podcast ended up being in character. And so the persona I created was this neo-anarchist, uh, you know, sort of shaman character. Hmm. And the more I got into character and the more I read um, the, the lore of Shadowrun, I started branching out into other cyberpunk stuff. And the more I got into cyberpunk itself and uh you know philosophy and and reading and and anarchism itself i sort of got radicalized um and and decided that this is uh 
it shouldn't have been a model for us to follow, but it should have been a uh, a warning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then started writing, you know, for for Shadowrun, and then started uh, another game company, and um, that's sort of my introduction through gaming. My introduction was, um, you know, when I was young, I wasn't really thinking about um, I, when I was reading Snow Crash by Stevenson and such. I thought to myself, this reads like a video game. You know, this is deeper in ways, but it it almost bridges a video game and a novel, and that was the initial appeal. But it wouldn't be until a couple of decades later when I got my master's in sociology that I actually started to appreciate the more industrial critiques and whatnot of um, industrialism that Gibson says that he was intending in his work. And that a lot of the authors were making these, you know, large um, political statements and whatnot. Uh, I didn't I didn't see that at the time. I'm just like, wow, this reads like a game. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me. Um, I was into cyberpunk for like, some, like as a little kid, you know, that's a, um, it's an, it's a gorgeous aesthetic. It's super uh, compelling. And for me, it was always this kind of interesting inverse of, um, like what we see in like Star Trek and stuff like that. And so, um, I always liked that kind of opposite side of like, what is the rest of society doing and what are, what are the plumbers and what are what's yeah the 95 percent doing and so that was always really compelling to me and then i got just head over heels into it um in grad school while i was doing a lot of programming and um ecology and i had a kooky old hippie uh phd advisor who was like to be in my lab you have to have read neuromancer and watch the matrix <laughs> and <laughs> so that was just kind of, we were doing a, a disease modeling um but we had like if you were if somebody knew joined the lab we would do a matrix movie night um if they hadn't seen the matrix and stuff like that just because it was so you just you, you're writing code you just you get you see what they're talking about like in in um snow crash and stuff like that where they're like and then i wrote 10 hours of code and that's a whole thing um and so, you know, kind of doing that and then having some fun medical um, surgical experiences brought me much deeper into the cyberpunk thing. And I was like, wow, and then it's 2020. So no going back. Um, of course, when, when you meant, once you mentioned, um, once you mentioned, co once you mentioned um, code, I ended, I ended up thinking of a, there, there's a there's a bit of a running joke I've heard, I've heard among I've heard among programmers and when I first heard about it I um I felt I it was one of those moments where I felt attacked but it but it goes 98 bugs in the there are 98 bugs in the code 98 bugs in the code take one down patch it around 99 bugs in the code <laughs> 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 I hate it because it ends because it ends up being true. You know, I went to school for video game design uh, in college uh, for a while, and it was very much like that. You would just go down the error sheet, and there would be like, "There's 121 glitches in Unity. We're gonna go through 121 glitches right now. Make some coffee." I think you need a bigger <laughs> pot. <laughs> yes. Um. But with that, but with that in mind, the second part of that question is what in a in a broad sense. Now we we tackled kind of the macro end of it with how with how you all got intruded, but in a broad sense, what what would you say are some of the pillars that draw people into Cyberpunk most consistently from um all of your different experiences? I I think I deal with this um quite a lot in the role-playing game uh, venue is that it is basically 100% um, aesthetic. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, like, that's not exactly what I would like it to be. Um, but when people see cyber arms and, and wires sticking out of people's heads and uh, cool transhuman abilities and... Uh, dudes with you know um anarchy tattoos and and chicks with 
fishnet stockings with their ass hanging out, like that aesthetic. And again, like I'm not, I'm not pushing a value one way or the other on that. I'm just saying that aesthetic is so attractive to a particular group of people. Um, and then the attitude that those characters seem to have. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to say something that I think is, is true if a little controversial, but I think a lot of people interact with cyberpunk or at least get introduced to cyberpunk in the way that, um, they get introduced and like Rick and Morty in that, like the show is about something, but I think a lot of the people who end up liking it at first glance don't actually get to see what it's actually about because they get stuck on the surface level aesthetic of it. Mm -hmm. See, that's interesting. For me personally, the thing I found so appealing about Cyberpunk when I was a kid and I was picking out games is uh, I had a knife go through my hand when I was a child and I lost a bunch of muscles and the ability to use it uh, in certain regards. Uh, and I also uh, was considered what they call neurodivergent now um, but I was uh, subscribed with some uh, learning disabilities and different things like that. And Cyberpunk, to me, had that on the cover. There's like a replaced arm. Mm. There's mm. like, and D&D and &D didn't have that. There was like, you needed magic to solve all of your problems. Right. But in like Cyberpunk, like there was just like, it had that where no one else seemed to have that in the like late 80s, early 90s. Um, I saw differently abled people, and yeah, there was some. There was definitely some booty, but there was also a lot more women and uh, different ethnicities there that I also found really appealing, comparatively to the very like Tolkien esque, almost like Aryan styling of some of the uh, fantasy games. So like, I, I felt like kind of the the disabledness of me and the disabledness of cyberpunk and it's facing that in endurance was was visually very artistically appealing for me mm. like a like a like a, a equalizing facing forward type type uh, aesthetic for you Where yeah like as a child you're, you're being like... represented in a way and empowered in a way that that maybe wasn't other places that's cool that's that's my my vibe <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think that's like, you know, I think that is kind of like one of the one of the pillars of cyberpunk is that there's often this, um, you know, mechanical solution to th to some of societal pr societal problems and things like that. But it's but I think it is also it is showing these people that aren't often shown in these other high fantasy or high sci fi things is, is showing the other side of, um, and I consider that an important part of cyberpunk to me. And I think it gets a little off the rails when people start focusing a little bit too much on the, um, you know, the, I don't know. I think it's important to have the, that really grassroots sci-fi is an important pillar of cyberpunk to me. And, um, and so I think of it as like a, a near, as like near future earth stuff and like, um, and, and yeah, that's those are those are some of my things with cyberpunk is definitely that yeah. I definitely agree that the aesthetics uh, draws a lot of people, and at first they're not thinking, okay, well they're just thinking that the cyborg looks cool, but they're not thinking what happens when half of society has the augmentations and all mm. of those advantages, and the other half does not, and inequality increases. You know, that's one of the depth right. more deeper themes that they don't get on the surface. Like Gibson said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Mm. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Agreed. Now, I, I want I want actually more stories that that highlight that. Um, well, I mean that doesn't it doesn't matter. I I agree one hundred percent with Cameron in that representation uh, of of people and and technology equalizing people you know things and in, in places of power is is actually really really good. Um, and that I think, I don't know, does that, does that take us away from cyberpunk and into more like cyber utopia? Um, because I, I do sort of, I, I do sort of, um, echo, uh, what Mark is saying in that in our world, what we're going to see more and more of is very, very wealthy people having access to all this cool shit and the people who can't afford it. 
basically instead of just having a, a wealth gap, they're going to have a power gap and a lifespan gap and a mm -hmm. uh, intelligence gap, you know, because the cyber stuff that we're, that we're, and, or more bio or whatever is going to be accessible only to the wealthy. See, that's a fear is, of mine anyway. Right. Like this is where I kind of think there's an interesting dichotomy between cyberpunk games and fantasy games because that is your achievement in fantasy games in skyrim whatever you want the biggest difference between you and your level one character your level 100 character needs to be super rich super powerful owning land having killing battles. gods yeah yeah killing <laughs> gods where in cyberpunk i feel like yeah, that inequality happens, but they're such small vignettes a lot of time with cyberpunk because they're, we, we're in this, and maybe this is the cyber noir of me, um, but they seem to be so focused on the actual person's mm. life that I feel like in cyberpunk, the only thing that you, the way you win is by enduring yeah. um, the inequality, like what you're doing day to day amongst that inequality because that inequality is just a factor and so like it's it's defining what in the inequality that you can affect and change what in the inequality you have to accept and how you're going to deal with those factors mm -hmm. whereas in like high fantasy or high science i feel like there's always a the answer is always acquire more mm -hmm. whereas in cyberpunk it's indoor no wow the That's noir part I find I find interesting um, because of the because of the fact that noir has a degree of inherent cynicism mm -hmm. due to due to the fact that in a lot of ways it's a response to a generation coming back from the Great War and be. But I do. But with a lot of um, with a lot of noir that I've read over the years, there's a kind of balancing between the gr between the griddle, grizzled cynicism um, of people who ha are the embodiment of I've seen some shit, and the people who have not, who have seen significantly le who may not have seen sh some shit or at the very least see it with a different perspective that. Are a bit more optimistic, a bit more hopeful. Um, that's why I don't. I always, I always, ca I, maybe it's just me, but I always caution um, going too deep in the into the cynicism end when it comes to um, something like cyberpunk. Because whenever I, whenever I think about that, I think about what happened with, say, Frank Miller. You know, somebody who. Inser inserts a lot of film a lot of film noir cynicism into his work but he never had a balancing act and that's probably the reason he went crazy um being in new york during 9 11 probably didn't help matters well no, cyberpunk also seems to be about preserving our humanity or our own sentience and questioning it which i i do love about that and i do think it keeps it from being too like atlas shrug and randian sometimes um because I definitely don't want to get into that. Uh, that gets like so like almost um, Terminator level of like brutality that I am not necessarily prepared for like genocide level <laughs> cyberpunk. At the, ver <laughs> at the very least, you'll be able to move stuff. You'll be able to um, you'll be able to move things easier around than tr than trying to move the Terminator skeleton was. Right. <laughs> Seriously, who the hell who the hell makes a prop out of steel? Well, and I, I'm curious what you guys also think. Yeah, because making props out of steel, but like there, I feel like there is a delineation. Like, because in cyberpunk, I think you can have like serious world, you know, pandemics, atrocities, different things like that. But I don't think you can have like an apocalypse um, for the. Uh, the genre to really work correctly. I think you need like basically that line string through time for humans to build upon. Otherwise you get into like Mad Max and, and other things like that. And that seems to focus in a different genre. Is it possible? I mean, and I'm just, I'm just winging it here because I think we have some cyberpunk experts here and I'm just a dabbler, but do, do we need late stage capitalism in order for cyberpunk to exist? <laughs> 
Um, I, you know, be, because you have this world mm. that is essentially created and sustained by the rich and the haves, you know, and, and, and the elite and the wealthy and everybody else, like, like you said, Cameron, just survives that. Can you have the, the, the cyberpunk genre without that sort of capitalist on top? I don't know how to do it. The other two may, but I agree with you completely. I, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to posit that this is, that this is the way to do it, but I, but I want, I want to, I want to put, I want to put a potential thought of instead of, instead of building a cyberpunk around late stage capitalism, building it around, and I don't, I, this may, this may sound like I'm bordering on um, steampunk with this, but building it around a technological gold rush, i.e. Mm. a new, i.e. a new type of technology is discovered in a given setting and everybody's trying to find new, new ways to, to, um, implement it. Um, as far as the whole thing with an apocalypse, um, I'm, I was going I was going to bring up Numenera honestly honestly but um that's a bigger can of worms than just cyberpunk elements. Right. Uh, the the first thing it makes me think of if 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 everybody has access to it um if if technology does in fact become the great equalizer mm -hmm. uh it the punk aspect gets lost a little bit, right? Um mm -hmm. in and this is how I've always sort of seen cyberpunk, but it's about, I mean, it's even less about the cyber than it is about like the, the power dynamics, right? Of the, the people who have it, the people who don't and, mm -hmm. and what ultimately can be done about that, if anything. Um, so I don't know, like just adding tech into something, uh, especially if everybody has access to it, is that, is that still cyberpunk? Right. This that that goes to like I, I will talk about this sometimes where it's like are the Borg cyberpunk and I don't think I don't feel the Borg are cyberpunk because I don't feel once again it has that inequality balance that you've you know talked about. Yes, they have really cool elements of like goth and punk, and uh, you know I loved the way they looked as a kid. They inspire art in me, but I don't feel like they they meet. Uh, correct cyberpunk criteria. I think I think the Bo the Borg to me rep um, seem to be a representation of the extreme form of Metropolis. I like that. Um, wow. Of course, Metropolis you have the you have the workers that maintain the city and the city itself, but with the Borg, those two are one in the same. Um. Which, um, which honestly, like what, is... what cyberpunk would be if if it was uh, created in um, in Russia instead of America? <laughs> um, no, I I can't really go with that because it's because um, as somebody, it was a half-hearted joke. <laughs> One, it's a I'm not going to defend joke, it, but I, I wanted to try. <laughs> I wanted to try and see if I could segue that half-hearted joke into an equally half-hearted joke about Slav Jank games. <laughs> um. That went over my head. I didn't. I didn't grab it. Look, the the closest I could come up with was a joke about I don't know stalker. <laughs> <laughs> but um. I do think, as far as the as, there is one there is there is one thing that I do find interest interesting because I would I would posit that from my perspective. The biggest, con the biggest contributor to the pop to the pop cultural presence that cyber that cyberpunk has in enthusiast culture is the is the pre is its presence in games, um, whether, whether it be video or on um, tabletop. Um, but at the but at the same time, and this is something, this, and this is what I want to posit to you. Do you? Th do you think that the um, pr that the presence that si that cyberpunk has ha has had through games and the like has led to, at the in an in indirect sense, a kind of static appearance of cyberpunk? Ooh, ooh, 
are we not adding feathers to our dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, that, that, that's exactly right. Like, that's a great analogy. <laughs> nice. I, I think so, yes. I think absolutely. Because I think we're stuck in this sort of late 80s version yeah, of that's the, what the future would, would be. Absolutely. I, um, I, re I remember being in, being in certain conversations. And when, when there were, when there were um, announcements for, um, I think this was Shadowrun 4th edition where they really made this push, which um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not bringing this up to do some sort of Shadowrun edition war. I want to make this clear. I'm doing this to make a point. I don't but, care if you do or not. I don't. I don't have feelings about. It. <laughs> Go right ahead. But there were there were some people who were crying foul about Shadowrun Fourth Edition's push to go for wireless technology instead instead of going for the, instead of going for the whole wired thing with um so, with cyber decks and the like. And of course, the extreme version of that was the introduction of um technomancers which i've always been kind of iffy about but i think I that had to do with the the matrix movies and wanting to you know tap into that which i can definitely get although um i'm pretty sure it could be argued that anybody in, that most of the matrix characters are are playing as adepts but the folk but there is this sort of i think i think um I think the big, I think the big tragedy of a film like say Blade Runner or the works of Mobius is that they ended up being too good of a visual representation of what can be done with cyberpunk when it's a when um the whole for me the whole concept of cyberpunk as a genre should be the beginning not the end. And I bring up the whole wireless thing because a lot of people cried foul over that over that not counting as cyberpunk somehow. To ha to have wireless technology, as if the tech, as if um, e as if technology shouldn't advance even in the future. Well, I'd like to hear Mark's thoughts on this, mm -hmm. since he's been talking to old school cyberpunk authors and stuff like that. Yep. So the question is regarding the um, the transition to wireless technology and this whole uh, movement away from cyber from uh, cyberpunk and what it is, etc. I guess. Um, overall, I'll, I think that I'm not going to answer directly, but I think that we have been moving away from the classic vision of cyberpunk and with games and with other things, we're becoming more pedantic in the way we're interpreting what it is. When I think of the classic cyberpunk books, I think of Frontera, Back in Flowers, Halo, Schism Matrix, Cat's World, uh, Night Sky Mine, and all of those books have something in common. They're all set in space, first of all. And when I look at the games that are out there today, none of them none of the cyberpunk games are really paying, it, paying it any attention to space whatsoever. Um, and part of that is because it's um, to move human uh, humanity to space, there had to be some kind of Armageddon or apocalypse in a lot of cases. And like you said, that's not something that cyberpunk uh, normally addresses today. Um, in looking at the wireless technology and uh, this transition away from the wire to the wireless uh, or the, to the digital from the analog, um, I don't have a direct comment to make on it. Um, I'm still kind of piecing it together, as you can tell. I yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, because to me, um, like, I kind of think of it, you know, uh, keep it simple in the name, right? You know, what is cyber, right? And so cyber, to me, is the Internet. And, um, I, you know, I think that's that could, people could kind of get into... Um, what 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 cyber means to other people, but I think uh, you know, kind of a quintessential thing is is uh, you know, um, internet. So whether it's through wires or through wireless is doesn't really bother me. Um, and um, we've got some, you know, the there's just some physics things uh, that wires talk about versus Wi-Fi. Um, but um, but it's uh, and that's why I get a lot of I have trouble disentangling late stage capitalism from cyberpunk because I can't help because I have that kind of gold rush thought like you would think of with Mel uh, Mildred mentioned um, this like 2000 this like kind of 90s the internet is new things are things are happening it's unregulated nobody's um, people are making money hand over fist people are losing money left and right left and right like I to me, those are um, kind of really 
uh, quintessential things in cyberpunk. So um, to me, a lot of the aesthetic flows from that kind of like, because people are partying, doing crazy, crazy drugs and stuff like that. Hence the booty comes. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that's too much of a ramble off that off topic from what you were kind of saying, Mildra. But no, yeah, I want to pick thought. up on that real quick yeah. because if that yeah. is the case, and society has moved on from that sort of simplistic view, mm. is cyberpunk still relevant in that way, mm. <laughs> or, or do we need another genre that sort of does what cyberpunk did, you know, twenty, thirty years ago? I. Mm. I can only speak for myself, but I would argue yes and no. I don't I don't think that Cyberpunk itself has become ir- irrelevant. What I what I do think is that the um, is that that particular style of Cyberpunk that that was that's very much rooted within um within an emphasis on street on street level because I need to I need to clarify something for me i look at cyberpunk as a as a bridge between the technophobic and the technophilic hmm. because if if you think about it think of think about um certain think about certain paranoias um during the 1970s one of the big ones and this ended up becoming a rec- a recurring um thing in doctor who for years was the fear of plastic like if you look at say an, an old Pong or um a lot or a lot of old cars, you'll notice that they'll have those those wood platings that seem to serve absolutely no purpose. That yes. was that was because just to give the aesthetic of this is not too futuristic. Everybody, calm down. <laughs> pretty much, like there there were, it's it's one of those things that's easy to joke about now, but there were legitimate fe- legitimate fears of. Um, the of new of uh, manufacturing cha- changes in technology in the seventies, um, making so things like plastic obsolete, um, and so, and um, and that's that's what I was getting at. Like, have we sort of jumped the, you know, like, have we jumped the future that cyberpunk sort of imagined, and into a equally dangerous, uh, but completely different future. Um, that's that's ahead of us. The da- the dangerous part that's that's far too subjective for me to tackle. What I do th- what I do what I do want to focus on, however, is the, is this notion that that per- with the particular style of cyberpunk that we saw, it was doing a it was doing a what if style prediction from the assumptions of the nineteen eighties. What I do th- what I do think needs t- what I do think we need to see it see a bit more of is a similar kind of what if slash logical conclusion prediction from more from um from from say the 90s or the early 2000s instead um and we we've kind we've kind of dipped into that sort of thing but not quite as far and that does bring me into um so into something regarding the whole space concept that i wanted to talk that i wanted to cover um one per- one particular ty- one particular type of space travel that has been discussed by fu- by futurists over the last decade is that of space elevators. And I'm mm-hmm. curious if you think that's a potential angle that can be tackled with cyberpunk in the in the next coming years. Well, space elevators really looks at the um, it, it really has to do with the infrastructure and whether or not the infrastructure is going to be consistent across the board and which countries will be able to access these space elevators and which will not. Mm-hmm. If they use what's called the um, space fountain technology with the pellets, then it would be a mobile elevator that could move from, from country to country. But if they use a static structure, then it would not. Uh, we see this problem with um, infrastructure in our own networks in our communities whereby if you live on one side of the railroad tracks you don't have access to the same mass transit as the other side of the railroad tracks consequently the poorer communities can't commute to work Mm -hmm. so we see inequality in the whole uh, connection between our networks and society now space elevators when you're talking about um, colonization extra colonization of other planets um, would only amplify uh, that inequality uh, regarding um, 
access and the, and the way you're connecting the, those nodes together and who has access to those nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that would be an interesting thing to explore in that what happens when, <laughs> what happens when the people who can afford to uh, start monopolizing and benefiting from space exploration and space travel and everybody else doesn't get to and you know what I mean like like what does what does a what does a space genre look like where the poor don't have access to space <laughs> right so mm. it's there in the background we but it actually it's meaningless to them we kind of had something like that in the uh, in the film Elysium um obviously obviously it ended obviously it ended up um having the problem that a lot of the a lot of um a lot of large budget film has when it comes when it comes to adapting high concept material in that it doesn't commit but there's a I mean, there's at least a dipping of the toe there right neuromancer also had a, a sort of dipping of the toe in that as well in that the the uber uber rich had their sort of what was it a satellite i don't remember how they got there yeah the tessia assholes yeah, yeah they had a suborbital facility which we actually have similar things in axon punk colin yeah. can probably expand on that yeah so like what happens when you have this great utopia that you know that that floats <laughs> uh but it's irrelevant to the majority of the population that's 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 absolutely ripe for explorer yeah exploral is that a word exploration yeah, for, for me um i can again this i feel like i feel like this is going to be my running gag but i can only speak for myself but there are certain given given Another angle that I think can be tackled is certain retro movements that have that have sprung up that have sprung up in subcultures in the last decade. Um, like it, for, like for example, um, Opti, you know you know how much of an you know how much of a music guy that I that I am given my particular tastes and that and that whole thing of making making soundtracks for different factions. Sure, um, I've. Like, there's been two there's been two trends in um in music that I that I've seen that really fascinate me. Um one of them has been the s slow rising resurgence of vinyl. Um, oh yeah. The most recent instance now there's been there's been argument that vinyl and uncompressed sound um actually has its advantages. Some oh, yeah. some people I'm will sure. um, swear by pl by playing audio by FLAC instead of MP3, oh. and as if to as if to demonstrate my point, the other day I found out that the that Trent Reznor put the Quake soundtrack on vinyl. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but there's there's good. been that there's there's been there's been several retro movements when it comes to when it comes to the punk and metal and metal scenes um, in recent years. Like sto they're like s genres like stoner doom have popped up that are very much a um, throwback to um, 70s hard rock. Um, there has been a new wave of traditional heavy metal and it's so good. <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't, don't whisper don't whisper in my ear like that again. <laughs> it is really um, good though. yeah and more recently thanks thanks to my brother I ca I came across um, something known as folk punk mm. which is also interesting a good example of that is the o <laughs> is the OCs spelled S E E S because obviously we got to do some sort of misspelling and that's some that's something else that I think I think can be tackled within the punk aspect of cyberpunk is is t is um retro romanticism which we kind of mm. already we kind of already have I mean, you've got you've got the you've got concepts like Street Samurai and Shadowrun that are um that are go that are trying to heed heed to old school ver versions of Bushido or sh or chivalry or mm -hmm. some or some sort of um internalized honor code. But I think I think these sort of retro movements is something is something that can be dipped a little further into. I mean, BattleTech's made a career out of out of out of retro romanticism for decades now. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to take a, a stab here uh, mm. and try to connect it to, to cyberpunk. Yeah. In that part of the, the punk aspect 
is um, uh, the good part of it, the aesthetic for me is not um, how do I say it uh, going against the grain right for the purpose of just simply um, again to bounce off something that that Cameron said earlier survival in, in, not just of your of your body but of your soul right like mm -hmm. like staking out a claim of individuality like like making your mark doing things because you like them not because you're supposed to right like that that sort of punk vibe shows through when we're doing countercultural stuff and i i haven't landed on whether or not that's good in and of itself because i know some really shitty people who have that you know that counterculture aesthetic but there is something to be said for not allowing the trends of society to dictate what you like or what you do or how you dress or, you know what I mean? Or, or what you label yourself as. And some of that retro stuff smells to me like people saying, I don't care what's popular. I want to do what I like. You know, there is some of that. And for me, like when it comes to punk, what is punk to me? When I was like a kid, if I was, if you asked me the 10 year old punk that I was, what punk was in like one word, I would tell you DIY. And I think that's like what makes cyberpunk so interesting is that people are doing it themselves. And like, that was, I feel like the original inception of punk with the Ramones and the Sex Pistols was they didn't have training. They weren't the Beatles. They didn't care if they couldn't play and they did it anyway. Um, and because they wanted to, you know what I mean? They didn't care if you came to their shows because other people were coming to their shows and they just wanted to increase what is their community. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like in both lines, those went very astray in certain ways, uh, you know, drug addiction, all sorts of, you know, suicide, all sorts of issues with punk rock. Um, but I feel like you're going to have that, those issues with any artistic movement, no matter what. And cyberpunk is definitely in this interesting place where it's maturing. Whereas like, cause it will, cyberpunk could arguably have been in its early days when I was a child. So we're really watching this genre incept itself into ourselves. So like the question of what is cyberpunk is still very, uh, is a very real question. But for me, the element that I love so much is, is DIY and do it yourself. Absolutely. And I think that cyberpunk uses the word punk correctly. But I think the word is overused overall. Uh, right now, there are over 35 subgenres of literature that end in punk, from diesel punk to biopunk to steampunk to <laughs> this and that, solar punk, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's become, and so Kevin Jeter, um, I was talking to him recently, KW Jeter, and Jeter was, um, I was also thinking about an interview that he had given 30 years ago with somebody else, where he talked about the creation of the word steampunk. And he said, I never meant to actually um, come up with the, with, with the word steampunk as a genre. I meant it as a joke, he said um, in that interview many years ago. Um, he said that once you put punk on the end of a word, people think that there's something happening, that it's exciting and it's vivid. But um, mm. he, he never even intended the word steampunk to catch on. It was just a joke. But once the Washington Post posted that, it became like everywhere. You know, steampunk became the word. Um, so they, we are overusing punk. I read a lot of self-professed um, authors who are writing punk genres where there's no opposition whatsoever going on. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Punk combines this freedom, this DIY, this be yourself uh, with this also sort of opposition to eh, perhaps the status quo. Um, and it may not be a philosophical opposition. It may just be um, it being in touch with yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great. <clears throat> and um, yeah, because even before you said it, as Mildred said, so well, double-headed dragon. But yeah, DIY was going to be the word that I was going to use. Um, and for me, because, and it has this funny counterculture element. And, and I think bringing up the vinyl, the, the kind of this, this retro kind of... Um, Fa you know, fantasization, fetishization in some ways is um, an interesting thing. Um, but to 
what's what's interesting and really compelling to me is the idea of this um, almost like a you know a quantitative um, superiority is kind of the word that's coming to my head, but like advantage is probably the better word or something like that maybe because like people are like, but man, have you heard it on vinyl? <laughs> and like, you know, on one hand, yeah, that's some hot air. But like when I was 18 and when Cameron put like, when you listen to Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath on vinyl, it sounds different. Like it's friggin' different. <laughs> it's and, different. I hate to say it. It's a thing. And like, and you know, in that like, um, you know, people are, uh, and it has this kind of interesting thing. And, and so people talk about, um, and they're like, yeah, well, the mainstream does this thing. And yeah, everybody can get MP3s, but like, dude, I went down to my record store and I found this like, you know, B side. And like, it's actually like, it's kind of better. And like, I don't know, I'm not trying to call it, I don't know, but that, like, that's kind of, that's part of that thing. And so like that thing in a certain way where they're like, yeah, well, there's kind of a difference. And so, and like, and that's the kind of the the wires versus wireless thing, um, because people are like, well, wires have a numeric, like, you know, the, you know, wireless. You you lose data when, um, like, it tra data transmits better through copper than it does through air, and it better through gold, and like, there's some physics behind it, and so, and that's why some people get so hyped about it. Um, and why my, my, I get hyped about it, but I'm like, but the math. <laughs> and, um, and so like, so, um, so yeah. And so like, that's, uh, yeah. And so that's where like some of the punk gets to it and why some people get so passionate about it. And they're like, but, but things, but like for real, we could do better everybody. Um, and like everything from listening to it on vinyl, but to reorganizing our government. Um, so yeah, and so that kind of that that's a big thing about it, and you know, and just the 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 internet connection of of suddenly making things open access and suddenly making things available. Why why cyberpunk resonates so much with me, and why I think, um, like uh, my buddy Will Hindmarch, um, he, uh, uh, or maybe it was Gibson. I don't know. Anyways, somebody put out like a, a you know a. a a game, something on um, like, you know, old uh, floppy cassette discs and uh, floppy discs. And you just, it, you had to pass it around. You had to copy it. It was very, and had that punk feel to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Mel thank you, Mildred. That's a great, that's a really cool example. Yeah. Now, when it came, I will admit that when it came to the, um, when it came to the con when it came to the concept of a gold rush that I was positing, what I was what I was trying to pivot what I was trying to pivot towards was the I was the idea of integrating aspects of cyberpunk as we know it with some of the romanticization that's seen in the old west, mm -hmm. um, where where you ha where you ha where you have these areas that are significantly more lawless. Not not in ter not full on Mad Max levels of lawless, but in ter but in terms of um, lo local small local areas that are li are a little bit more untamed. Um, One would argue the word frontier. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that uh, Mark hit on that. I think it was Mark when we were talking about space, mm -hmm. right? And it, it strikes me that in in that regard, um, Firefly, to some example, or to some extent, was was a sort of space punk, uh, right? Where you had this sort of frontier where everybody sort of gets to do their own thing uh, to various results, but ultimately it's still under the thumb of some, you know, really large, uh, unassailable uh, authority. And you had like a, you know, there a, a band of people doing it their own way. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I, some people would argue that country uh, or like Western is the progenitor to punk, like the aesthetics of, say, spaghetti Westerns and that idea of DIYing 
that type of stuff together on low budgets definitely inspired a lot of punk things as well as a lot of the 70s you know cheap western cinema uh, you know the the concept of of one person you know changing their life you know and we we have the range that's kind of the privilege of punk is that there is both the european influences and the american influences and how that sort of works out they all seem to be centered once again around a a new technology a new frontier like the western is is a new land to explore the sci-fi is a, a new expanse into space and so for cyberpunk it's that new expanse into the net which is its yes. own ocean yeah yes. like, that's the net feels the th mm. that's what's so cyber in the cyberpunk to me is that you are a punk in the frontier of the internet yes um yeah. without those things like i don't feel like trek survives without the internet the, the star trek the original trek does not have real internet um definitely nothing like real like real wi-fi um but it is still sci-fi whereas <laughs> cyberpunk if you strip away the internet we, we remove our genre I, I mean it's interesting the the conversations going around um news outlets the last couple of weeks is is that wild west era of the internet actually closing now right with with governments actually saying no you can't have this app or no you can't go to this site you know and america had had sort of been immune to that largely um but now you know that door has been opened you know with the banning of certain apps etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's a that's an interesting uh, look towards the future and regarding wild west i wonder if uh, a, a true western punk would be uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, of one of the natives, right? <laughs> instead right? of instead of a lawman, uh, you know, in, enforcing law and order uh, onto onto something on behalf of. Uh, oh, bar a barring that, you can base, <laughs> barring that you can use Australia. You know where everything wants to kill you, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I want to see the Lone Ranger if, from Tonto's perspective and him writing it in Zine. You know, <laughs> like, like, I wonder. Well, we had, Tonto we just had it surviving, from, right? We had he it hitches his wagon to somebody who's who's going to be able to get him what he wants. <laughs> we we had it kind of from Tonto's perspective. It's just that that movie ended up sucking. Oh, the Johnny Depp one. I I I, I, right. I purged that from my memory. I that's, forgot that's, that's right. That's right. I ref I refuse to purge that from my memory because if I forget, then somebody's gonna want to try again. Never. Forget. Oh, good on yeah, you. I haven't yeah. I haven't seen History that one. History repeats. So. Good. Yeah. Let's not let us never forget. But, okay. Yeah. So a punk but, western I would profit to you is a Django Unchained. Sure. That's that's absolutely right. I'd be I yeah. would be. I would be willing to. I would be willing to go with. I would be willing to go with that one. Um, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into that. Um, I mean, it's just the perspective. So, the imbalances are there. The, the, I mean, there's the conflict, uh, punching up, and things like that yeah. in interesting yeah. ways. Um, and because to me, um, I think of like, you know, you mentioned, you know, it, you know, maybe from the native perspective, you know, and I would also think of it, you know, another interesting story in that potential area would be, you know, a story from, you know, the, the gold miners who are striking out, right? Sure. We're always hearing the story of the guy who made it, the one who fat, the one in a thousand, you know, one in a million who makes it. You know that's I'd, I'd imagine, yeah. I'd imagine you know. that that the culture within within the people within having all those people trying to be that guy who makes it can can um, result in a lot of what I call the Roman handshake. Mm. Which um, well, how how many times? Oh, yeah, you you can I think you can attest to this. How many times has has a shadow run campaign gone down where some um degree of backstabbing ends up being in the third act <laughs> uh, it's not a shutter run if there's no backstabbing yeah right yeah yeah you well know, and i'll and, also uh, postulate that like blazing saddles is also another very punk absolutely yeah. yeah like queer representation like all sorts of questioning of society all of these things and that was a very early movie for me so yeah like I a very honest speaking like plain sp like it's a comedy right but like 
plain speak about racism in the old west right, right? like like it is yeah absolutely and with and with improvement and with change and being like no actually let's have a black um you know um uh uh sheriff and things are actually going to work better and like let's learn and move on yeah. um yeah that's that's very punk in my in but my view for me now this is something i touched on in the past and something i i remember touching on very specifically when um i was when i was discussing with opti about uh, game about gangs of the undercity because Part of the, part of what appealed to me about the, about that particular project was seeing some of the aspects of of uh, that, I, that I see with cyberpunk with with some aspects of magic without some of the baggage and expectations um, that's in Sh that's in Shadowrun because a big thing a big thing that's ki that's kind of become my stamp over over the last six years has been thumbing my nose at tradition for tradition's sake or as i've often called it designed by gospel um and in that regard i've had now maybe 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 some of you have had a similar experience but i feel that that the worst thing to happen to any um fictional medium up to and including cyberpunk is the notion that there is a way that you're supposed to do things Mm. Um, mm. To illustrate to illustrate my point, consider the band the U, not not the U, uh, the um, Refused, who, if you've been who if you've been following Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, you've already heard one track of them because that's the band that they that was contacted to play the role of samurai, mm. which I thought was I thought was a brilliant move because a long time ago they put out an album called The Shape of Punk to Come. And even though this album is very influential, it was extremely controversial at the time because it was using instruments and using musical techniques that were seen as far too electronic for punk. Hmm. Awesome. Wait, wait, wait. So what? It seems like a weird criticism to me. That's a very strange criticism, especially for me coming from the like early ages of punk, where there's a lot of synth, especially in like the Susie Sue sort of situation. Um, so like, especially in like ministry. So I'm... to some degree, I think that um, punk rock, punk rock was reacting against the kind of pretentiousness of progressive rock, which had become mm -hmm. so um, over the top and complex and um, electronic, etc. Now. The Shape of Punk to Come came out in 1998, um, and like, I guess as strange as as strange as that, I think I think a good chunk of of that um of it of that of that controversy um had had to had to do with had to do with the with the fact that one of one of the one of the one of the main things that they did was all of it was a lot of um, sampling. Mm -hmm. Like they did, they did, they did a lot of they did a lot of um, a lot of sampling. They used soundscape quite a bit. Um, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of playing instruments and the, then recording and then et and then editing the um, recording and. Like, and there's there was this very there was a very traditionalist ap approach with a lot of with a lot of with a lot of um, movements within punk that want that um wanted you to just stick to playing instruments. Now I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. That's just a thing. And there is also the there is also the fact that 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 um. That uh, that um that al that album had el had elements of like te of like techno and jazz, which I think the fact that they were dipping into te into those particular genres was what really pissed off certain traditionalists. Um, <clears throat> and this kind this kind of goes back into that whole being stuck in the eighties thing. Like, I don't th I don't think there's any malice behind a, behind a lot of people who want who want who um want that visual aesthetic for cyberpunk it's more of 
that's the visual aesthetic that they gravitated to, and the yeah. and they ended up getting too attached to that. Mm. And for and the reason I bring this up with Refused is they were ch they were challenging the musical aesthetic that yeah. a lot of people had become attached to when it came to punk. See, That's for the musical aesthetic of punk, when it comes to when I've played in bands that were mm -hmm. punk, we define punk as a approaching instrument, no matter what it is, without educational bias. Um, now, a lot of us would like, like, the m people that were self-taught tended to access punk grooves better than people who tended to be uh, educationally taught music. So a lot of people who uh, were playing in bands with us that had a lot of music training would actually have to approach the instrument uh, from a uh, more pure or uh, childlike approach to it, like a white belt kind of Zen style approach where you're not playing the instrument in the, you know, uh, conceived way. This arguably could go back to Jimi Hendrix and him hacking a right-handed guitar into a left-handed guitar mm -hmm. and changing up a bunch of stuff and being just like a massive inspiration for punk. Cause like you can ask, any punk interview like of the Ramones or anything that Hendrix will come up over and over and over again. Arguably he is possibly the original punk. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see, I can, that's definitely something I can see. Um, well, like, I mean, just real quick. I mean, you uh, consider like the talking heads were, ooh. were considered punk, mm -hmm. right? And like, they don't have, any of that aesthetic look to them and, and their their music isn't that far out but the things that they're saying are direct challenges to the status quo oh yeah right like so sure bands like that's and and when you talk about uh sampling music right if you're not paying for it and you're putting music that somebody else made back into the public domain without paying them for it that's punk as fuck <laughs> like yeah. like the, the idea that 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 you know music doesn't belong to everybody is such a new idea right and like rebelling against that and and keeping it out of the hands of somebody who you know especially like a record company that could just continually make money ad infinitum you know for a finite amount of of somebody else's work is absurd and so i really love the fact that you could just grab a vinyl Right and go to town and and you know put your own spin on it and put your own additions to it and start making your own music and your own version you know for for the people again. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. We should we'd probably be able to go a lot further a lot further with the concept of sampling if it weren't for Gilbert O'Sullivan. <laughs> if any mm -hmm. if any of you are familiar with that particular story. I am not. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to show my ignorance, but but I don't know what you're saying. So you're probably familiar with Biz Marquis. Um, yes. Every, everybody mostly knows him for him, for being a one hit wonder, but beyond the rest of the stuff, he was exactly what you would expect a a, um, a late '80s rapper to sound like. Um. But he, but. An album that he did shortly after his shortly after his hit um, ended up sampling a song from from Gilbert O'Sullivan, and he and he was not happy about about the sampling. Told told him don't release the thing. The thing got released anyway. He sued. This went up to criminal court, and the judge ordered every single one of that album taken off the shelves. And in the process, it pretty much killed the golden age of sampling in the 80s. Brutal. I mean, sampling, sampling still exists, but... Um, you probably have to pay, you know, the record companies to use that. Well, you, you, do have to, you do have to pay... You'd have to, you'd have to do a whole lot of paying. Or in the case of, in the case of what happened with, um, with the film Johnny Got His Gun, you'd just, bu just, buy the, <laughs> just buy the rights to the film. 
<laughs> that, that's what Metallica did for in order to do the music video for one. They just they just outright bought the rights to the to the film so that they could do the music video they had planned. Speaking of not punk. But that brings up the um but it in it, and it uh, what I kind of wanted to say about this was about, you know, punk is this wild concept, right, of, of uh, you know, flashes and of ideas, inspiration, approaching things from novel perspectives and pushing the bleeding edge of technology. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it we've had this for how many, how you know, since how many decades has this idea been out there? And so the you know, the, con- the concept changes of what is punk over time. And um, and so I'm a big fan of the kind of the fluid idea of like what is punk is like well what decade of punk are we talking about, and um, and so what ine- what kind of inevitably happens is um, the punks get older, and they become the tastemakers, they become the trendsetters, they become the ones, uh, they become the old guard. No disrespect to the old guard, but what is more pi- pu- uh, punk than pissing off the old guard? <laughs> yeah like um, whatever it is <laughs> and so like that's kind of my view on like what is punk and and like it's when i was a kid though you know i remember like you got to know the right bands man you got to be able to know like name this shit so you can be a punk and like sure that's what i thought when i was 13 but um but now i think it's like yeah it's whatever's pissing people off and whatever's pushing the edge so, so let me let me ask you about that. Like, if yeah. it's is, is and this comes up with when we talked about um, like the Sex Pistols, for example, and the Ramones, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, especially in light of uh, <laughs> current current events, right? Where where uh, you know Johnny Rotten's wearing the the Make America Great shirt, right? Like, so it's just pissing people off enough to be punk, or is Good it important? Question, right? Is it important who you're pissing off? Right, right. Because right. you're pissing off. The people who are exactly. already getting pissed on, Ooh, right? I like That's that. what matters. Thank you so right. much for bringing that up and clarifying that because that, my dude, thank you so much for clarifying that because that's what really matters is the is the power element, the direction. Because it's not just about breaking windows; it's about whose windows are being broken and why right. the, are the windows being broken. This so is there's a value I'm, underlying yeah. that. Then yeah. um, this is the problem with Johnny Rotten. And, and, and I will antithesis this is this punk and it doesn't come across as all punk, but Johnny Rotten specifically does offend people to be offensive. He does not use that power properly. I feel as like a lot of the Ramones were very careful about painting things like the Vietnam war, things like that. The sex pistols did not do that. Now the guitarist from the sex pistols was really, really effective in that. And he had a lot to say. But Johnny sadly has, has has crapped on a lot of their good work. Yeah, um, yeah which which again just it. is it brings up the question, right? Like, is that still punk if all you're doing is making people angry with no real? Yeah, um, I don't. Right. Is, is not, nihilism a, in and of itself? Issue. Yeah, that's punk. been an issue yes. for a while, yes. and um, yeah, that's that's always whenever that's that's why I brought up um, Frank Miller earlier and. While that doesn't relate to punk, what it does relate to is the importance of having a balance. And to do mm-hmm. that, I want, I want to contrast um, Frank Miller because everybody knows how um, absolutely off the rails he, en- he ended up going through his career. Um, with, an- with, an- with another author who tends to deal in dark subject matters in Junji Ito. Mm. One of who's one of the most prolific authors when it comes to Japanese horror. Talking about Through pushing boundaries, his, yeah. <laughs> especially he he's Ito is very much a graduate of um of a, a fair a fair mix of cosmic horror and the body horror works of Cronenberg. Especially especially if you've read through stuff like Uzum like um Uzumaki. One of my favorites. Which, is, which I'm glad to see is getting animated, and good luck to the um, <laughs> studio that's doing that. Um, but but um, 
you look at you look at his you look at his work and he and despite the fact that he can't write an ending to save his life and I think he would admit that when you look at his writing and then you look at how he acts in his personal in his personal life when he's not but when he's not behind the pen and he is a complete goofball <laughs> like he he um he ends up he he ends up back he ends up acting like a com, a, com, a complete one eighty from what you'd expect of his writing, and I think that I think that's worked for the best for him because he has that kind of balance. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Well, like in the case of Frank Miller or Johnny Rotten, mm-hmm. like it seems like a case of I'm going to be punk or I'm going to push a boundary, but then once I get mine, I'm going to <laughs> flip that script. And be very protectionist about yeah. what's mine. I I see where that's going, but I don't I don't think I don't think like that's a sort of libertarian mm-hmm. uh, that still wants to say I'm an anarchist, but not really because yeah. I'm for the status quo because I still yeah. have all my money. I yeah. um the way I the way I see it, it com- it comes. There needs there, you need to have a balance between being between being a destroyer and being a creator. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. Like I, I had critis for for a um for a paper I did a long time ago. I talked about how the film Scream was a kind of ritual burning of mm. a lot of um of ba- basically of the slasher the slasher um, villain archetype of the of the eighties. But the unfortunate problem was that that film didn't build up a replacement. It didn't build up a new a new paradigm that could be the um, blueprint for films to follow. If there's any, if there's anything that ended up being the rebuilding in that regard, it, as much as much as I hate to admit it, because I'm not a fan of the film, it'd probably end up being Saw, at least the, at least the first two films. And to tie to tie this to tie this back, I look at somebody like Frank Miller. I look at somebody like Johnny Rotten as purely destroyers. Hmm. Now that now, being a destroyer in that regard is not a bad thing per se. It becomes a bad thing when destroying is all that you do. You got to have balance. Yeah, about ten years ago, there's a lot of postmodern um, authors and speakers I was listening to, and it became pretty clear to me that they were really adept at sort of talking about the problems of modern society, but they didn't. Whether they whether they couldn't or whether they just hadn't got around to it yet, offering any decent solutions or ways forward. Mm-hmm. So I, I agree with you. Yeah, and the problem the problem is for for me when I see when I see when I see a lot of um, when I see a lot of those same kind of authors talk talk up talk up about the about the problems without 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 provi- without providing solutions or providing any sort of attempt to rebuild all I'm seeing is a dog sitting on a nail mm. and what and howling about how much it hurts to sit on the nail but they won't move mm-hmm. um I don't know that's all that is right I because <laughs> I think <laughs> before any good ways forward you have to be that person who breaks down first especially when you have such uh awful and entrenched systems of power like there has to be a breakdown of those first it has to be a a well thought out attack on those corrupt systems of power well so i'm not i'm not down keyword, though yeah i'm not down on people who are who are attacking corrupt systems of power and things that need to change i just i'm with you when we also say like i'm also a, an optimistic person a hopeful person i want i want the way forward i don't want to just throw my hands up and say well this is what it is yeah, yeah. well and i think this is where punk diverged into punk and goth because Punk is arguably, because they were both the same thing in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And I think in the 80s, we really diverged. And a good example of where it really diverged, whereas Trent Reznor with Nine Inch Nails is very goth. I would argue that he is not punk because he does not have the optimism that he can make the world a better place and wallows. In, and I love him for it, but he wallows in almost the nihilism of it. And that's, that's the gothness of the the division in music as i feel like it broke in the 80s whereas you know 
Suzy Sue, a lot of these other uh, original Bauhaus, things like that, could arguably be punk and, and would be playing the same shows and venues and spaces that, you know, the Ramones and other punk bands of the era were, you know, carrying. But there was a definite divide, and I feel like punk is DIY and optimistic, whereas goth tends to be more uh, wrapped up in sort of a denialist sort of a aspect. And I love goth, so <laughs> uh, that's, that's kind of my feel. Mm-hmm. So I, I wanna I wanna ask like Cameron I agree with you like uh, as far as DIY and optimistic, um, but some of our some of our canonical books uh, don't seem DIY or optimistic all always like the um, again I'm going back to Neuromancer right that doesn't seem DIY or particularly hopeful uh, or, or am I reading him wrong? Uh, well, you know, and uh, or maybe we're gonna go actually. with Neuromancer for sure. I feel like it's a folly of optimism. They're constantly thinking that they're gonna make it in Neuromancer, and 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 in Neuromancer, especially like my favorite char- character Molly, um, her fight to basically have her past erased and to escape her servitude is so optimistic. That's why she keeps going through all of this physical pain, all of these adjustments, because she will like work her way out of this. And I don't know if that's like, maybe in Case's uh, situation, it definitely seems more like cigarette smoke nihilism in my in my thing. But uh, I personally am an AA member and I've been sober for five years and it's an alcoholic. So I, I feel like Case has that circling the drain feeling that I had that comes in with that nihilism. Whereas Molly um, especially shows optimism uh, and, and things that she keeps internalizing, things that she can physically do herself. Like I can cut through this with my fingernails. I can enhance myself, you know. Um, or, you know, as such as the optimism of like, the sp- uh, the space Rastafari is like this weird. He was, he was a, a great character, <laughs> right? Like he's like super optimism. He's like even <laughs> like even written in as like a floating person. He's like so above everyone, and he you know it, it, I, I see that. But like in case I definitely feel my addiction, and I and I think Gibson and I are on the same page with that. So maybe maybe it's a question of focus, right? So case is, is meant to be the point of view character, but but maybe that sort of makes makes me in my reading a little bit myopic, and I'm not seeing the optimism around it. Yeah. Well, also, but I I will also say I am I'm by an LGBTQ, so like the opti- that my on ramp is not necessarily case in that particular. It, and so like it does a, a matter of perspective. Like when I read Neuromancer, it was very Molly. Like I always felt yeah. like I was Molly looking at Case. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Case. Surely, if I had a cyber deck, I would be that cowboy, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's a good call. That's a good call. Yeah. Good well, I mean, for so for like for me, I like I see myself in Case, and I really like Neuromancer. And I think the reason why my um like my PhD advisor brought like made all of his students read Neuromancer was because of uh, because and like i don't know I, again i think this is like like you said kind of a question of focus and people take different things away from the 192 pages or whatever it is um but i like for me i saw myself in case and you know that that person circling around the drain the person who has an absurd responsibility placed upon them and then somehow friggin pulls it off and and like on one hand like it there is like there is a healthy amount of like deus like god help like you know with um winter mute helping case and, and funding him and doing this stuff like that but the whole plan hinges on this dude's brawn coffee maker basically to me and like can he friggin can he pull off the code um and like the 
it doesn't matter how much money is actually there because uh, you know what if he he's got to get his semicolons right and like that and the and to me that is like to me the the question of like right or wrong or or growth or creation or just versus destruction to me it's kind of it's kind of progress like sometimes you got to destroy things sometimes you got to you got to grow things like where is our progress and what is kind of moving us forward and what are what is the kind of quantitatively better way or i don't know like i get a little numbers about it but like you know what's the best what what does the music sound the best on man is it on the vinyl is it on the mp3 you know is it on what's the newest thing that's around the bend that we haven't seen before do we need to look forward do we need to look backwards um you know it's always a different thing but whatever it is we're trying to move forward and that like to me is kind of the punk thing because like and that's why people will pry my cables from my hands because it's like until you give me something that is gonna give me data faster than a hardwired internet connection yeah show me something better and uh, and that's why like you'll pry my goofy anarchist views but show me something better <laughs> so let's go um that's kind of my view on it yeah i can de i can definitely um go with that now Obvious, obviously, um, there's there's been a lot of talk in the in re, in recent years with the with the revive with the bringing of um of the of one of the more quintessential cyberpunk RPGs into a lar into a a larger platform by having one of the most respected um, game design studios ha handling its adaptation. But when it comes, do you do you suppose that in wake of that the um, the fi the fiction world is go is going to be dealing with some ripple effects in the coming years mm. in term in terms of what in terms of what sort of media gets gets put out and say the next say the next five years or even ten years. You know, it's interesting, the ripple effects and whatnot and um, what's coming ahead of us. I've been talking to a lot of the classic cyberpunk authors recently on what, um, you know, the impact that 2077 will have and what cyberpunk is going to look like in the coming decades. And this conversation really revolved around optimism and pessimism uh, going into what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Swan Rebeski and Shiner and others, they all weighed in and they're all looking for a new form of um, cyberpunk but they do there's this cry for optimism to enter the genre from most of them but they're all saying that 2020 is not the year that it's going to happen that after everything that's happened this year it's going to be two decades before we see any optimism in cyberpunk whatsoever so 27 so 2077 may affect the future of cyberpunk literature but it's going to remain dystopian as ever um, there was one man who descended kevin jeter who wrote dr adder in 72 uh, published in 84 um, which is the quintessential um, cyberpunk text to me. And Jeter said that if you ever make cyberpunk optimistic, you are just cultivating ignorance, was basically the gist of what he was saying. Um, and that its purpose is dystopian in nature. Uh, dystopia and utopia, we throw these words around, but they're based on a common set of values. We look at dystopian as being inequality. We look at utopian as typically being more equality or post-scarcity. Uh, if we think of Plato's Republic and sharing the women, for instance. Um, so I think that, yes, 2077 will have an impact on cyberpunk uh, literature. Uh, with that being said, I think it will remain just as uh, pessimistic and dystopian as ever, especially after the occurrences of this year. I've, part, of the, part of the reason I bring up this kind of ripple effect is because of what I saw in, in fantasy literature, in the wake of um in, in first first in the wake of the lord of the lord of the rings films which i know i know the purists really don't like those films but um i can i cannot go with that same sort of purism without coming off as a massive hypocrite so i don't um <laughs> and when through the when those came around you started to see a tr a trend of of a more serious take on them um, on on fantasy from a lot from a lot of different literary sources 
And this, this ended up escalating with the one-two punch that was the popularity of Game of Thrones, thanks to the TV series, and The Witcher. Um, especially, in, especially in part due to um, CD Projekt Red's adaptation of The Witcher. Um, more, I'd, say, I'd say that had a bigger contributing factor more than the um, original books did. Now, the, now, I want to focus on that latter one in this case, because what it ended up doing for fantasy is that there became a greater push for more low fantastical elements, um, al almost, almost bordering on historical fantasy due to the minimization of, ma of magic, the supernatural, and the kind of stuff that's expected from high, fa from high fantasy a la Tolkien. And for me, I can see I can see the possibility of a similar but different ripple effect in the, in the coming years with Cyberpunk tw twenty seventy seven coming around. Um, not in the, not in the exact same way as as I saw in the aftermath of The Witcher, but definitely in a definitely in a similar um, vibe. Now, as far as now, I don't see that happening this year, obviously, because it's kind of hard to have that ripple effect in just two months. But I wouldn't be surprised if if I started to see more cyberpunk um, novels being being written in the next two years. Oh, and entire companies are springing up around twenty seventy seven. I'm not going to mention company names for the sake of um, not advertising, but mm -hmm. I can think of at least five companies, magazines, etc. Um, that are you know starting up around this to uh, capitalize on the merchandising, etc. Yeah, um, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hurt that the same week that that game is coming out, a um, a different game that I've been looking forward to called Ghost Runner is going to be is going to be coming around. Um, with that, with that one aiming le aiming less for the simulationist aspect of twenty seventy seven and more for a more parkour approach um it's definitely going to be interesting for speedrunners but i do i'm not going to say that you're going to see some sort of second golden age but i do th i do think that this is also going to be reflected in um in uh, in other media like for example i think a case in point is the fact that a an a animated adaptation of cyberpunk has been greenlit that's being animated by of all studios studio trigger and while that that's not going to come out for at least another year it is kind of highlighting this rip, this um ripple effect um one thing one thing that i'm one thing that i'm curious about is do you th do you think do you think the possibility that the gaming end of things ends up being the Spe the spearhead when it comes when it comes to pushing um cyberpunk um now ob obviously there's going to be a bit of bias because i've got three game designers in this call but mm. from for me i that's the, that's a possibility that i can see when it comes to cyberpunk for me i always feel like we're spearheaded by literature like, I mean, I would, as an artist, I would like to say that cyberpunk is spearheaded by art, by some of the cool things that, you know, some of the Korean trash artists were doing in the late 70s and like Bauhaus movement and things like that. But I, I think like the word cyberpunk and, and like what is defined as cyberpunk was, it was just murky when it was artists before the writers got a hold of it. So I think like whether it's games or movies and things like that, without the the novel or the short, especially the short story weird fiction aspect of it, I feel like the short story weird fiction aspect like really enhances and pushes cyberpunk forward. If we don't have those weird short stories like uh, I Dream of Electric Sheep and different things like that, or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, we're not going to progress. Um, I think that's that's where a lot of our inspiration comes from. Mm -hmm. And 
within within that one one of the things I'm one of the things I'm curious about is do you think do you think that there do you think that there's a possibility that this like I said this rip this sort of ripple effect might also might also be channeled into music as well because we've talked about it how it gets channeled into books and how it get how it might get channeled into games or film or the like but Music is something that isn't really touched on in the, in this same conversation. There's so many genres that are associated with cyberpunk, whether it's synthwave, retrowave, vaporwave, vapor trap, and all sorts of you know. And these genres come up and they come and go within sometimes one or two years. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's all electronica in the end. Um, it, they separate them by how many beats per minute there is, whether there's a triplet beat on the trap, etc. So minor separations between them. Um, you'll see the uh, the illusion of novelty that will come up, but if you dissect it to its basic components, I don't think it will be as novel as it appears. All right, that that's definitely something I can see. Um, you know, when I'm when I'm when when the whole old when the whole old west thing came, came up, there was one there was there was one aspect that that um that I did that we didn't get the opportunity to touch on at that point, and. That is that is the notion. I wanted I want to touch a bit on the con on the concept of the street samurai of sorts. And uh, Mark, I know I know I had spoken with the with you on the on a similar concept of um of possibly using other moral codes for for a cyberpunk protagonists that would fit that would fit within that archetype, but do but do different spins, like focusing more on chivalry than on bushido or the like. But absolutely the. But I, but the thing that I, the thing that's interesting about that particular interpretation is the way uh, the way it's it's based it's based on a version the street samurai in that sense is based on a version of um of internal honor that is relatively newer compared compared to how honor was treated um in cultures up in, up until a certain point um now in the case of Japanese culture the big, the biggest game changer on that front was Miyamoto Musashi's book The Book of Five Rings which was putting a lot of um Japanese um samurai culture within a very harsh microscope and do you th do you think there's the possibility of a of having the having the quote unquote street samurai archetype, but focused more on classical honor in the sense of honor being group based instead of being individually based based ex, i.e. an external honor system. Uh, if I can hop in here real quick, that was one of the things that we were tossing around um, during the world building for gangs of the undercity mm -hmm. is going back to a uh, concept of like r rather than individualism, which I admit has been a pretty big staple of cyberpunk. Um, but, but what, a, what if your community is also punk along with you, right? Like what if it's not just extreme individuality, but what if uh, doing things on behalf of your community to lift each other up is, is also a good and so we've been toying around with what does it mean to not necessarily the traditional honor and shame based stuff, but like, what does it mean to honor your, your community? Right. And how does your community build you up at the same time? So I think that's a, that's a fascinating thing to, I'll, I'll bow out now. I want to hear what everybody else has to say. Um, so for us, for me, like when, when it comes to like writing culturally s stuff, like that in axon punk we don't have like a whole lot of japanese background colin and i but i personally have um a lot of like chinese martial arts backgrounds i i competed um for a very long time in the u.s and i uh, i still do you know uh tai chi and martial arts daily and so like the idea of the Chinese sort of Kung Fu master from like Hong Kong films and things like that really inspired uh, Kung Fu stuff 
in in Axon Punk for us. And I feel like that's sort of a thing that happens in the 80s is like I feel like that that was sort of a thing that they distorted the idea of samurai and kung fu master in 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 different ways because they were in they, they were taking in these movies at the same time in the same cinema they're looking at you know an Akira Kurosawa film on the same weekend they're looking at a Bruce Lee film and especially to America in the 80s they were very similar whereas now we're very well educated as to to why that was different i feel like one of the interesting things about cyberpunk is the softening of those things and the romanticizing of that relationship. Like Samurai Champloo, the anime that I really, really love, has that wonderful like duality of what is to is it to be samurai? Are you uh, Mugen? Are you Jin? Like what is that? The whole like range and Okinawa based samurai code versus Edo code. Um, and uh, I, I still feel like in, in a lot of them, a uh, community base is still uh, represented, you know, love for, for your community, whether that's distorted and, but, you know, because that would be like, the emperor is God. Therefore, the love of God is loving your community. So that that can be a serious problem when it's distorted. But like I think the the general idea of martial arts, whether it's Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Thai, Filipino, is self improvement and improvement of of your community, the ability to replicate and expand this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, and I like it on the kind of like the street samurai. Like bringing the idea of the code in, uh, you know, kind of whatever code it is, um, you know, and I can see why, um, you know, people bring in the Bushido stuff, and, you know, it harkens back to the, to the, you know, you know the things like that. But it's um, to me, it's like it kind of it reminds me kind of of like game theory stuff. Like, if everyone agrees to play by this set of rules, the pirate code, or whatever you got going on, then we can all, you know, the, the mob rules, then we can all benefit. And, you know, the community will grow and things like that, and we can do the right handshake to get to the, through, the, through the door. And, um, and I can see, and, and you get this in Neuromancer with Molly going around and maintaining her network and um and i can see why people will romanticize some of this stuff because they'll say like i have like I, I like you know oh the you know people talk about the katana oh but it's the most deadly weapon things like that nothing's better and shit like that you know um and so i can see why people kind of romanticize it but it's um it has this interesting like as long as everybody plays by the so same rules then we can all benefit as long as no one's wearing a wire or whatever. Um, and it's an interesting and, and noir and cyberpunk thing because like eventually somebody's going to be a rat or whatever. And that's the, it's a, yeah, I, used, I, I like that in an, as a compelling kind of story structure. Oh yes. It's very difficult to reconcile punk in a sort of collectivism um, regarding playing by the rules and the system will work. The, I don't know if the punk then becomes sort of a free rider in this system. Right? Yeah, so, it's an interesting so thing. You can go to all, all sorts of different tangents. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. What is the percentage of free riders in that? Absolutely. Is it frequency dependent where you reach a certain threshold and then the whole thing fails? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of those things where um, it can potentially be open season. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as far as the collectivism thing, um, I mean, there there are even even to, even putting aside the have have nots of people in the corpse and people outside of that, there are still um, organizations like gangs and and similar communities um, 
Pers personally, I'm just I'm just I'm just pining for the days until until someone does the cyberpunk version of the Warriors. <laughs> you know, just, yeah, just so, I'm, I'm just working so on it. <laughs> just so I can just so I can freak out my table by br by bringing in three glass Coke bottles. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you can do it, man. <laughs> I can I can prob I can probably I can probably find a few bottles of Mexican Coke somewhere around, somewhere around here, um, <laughs> but the but I do I do think that there is I get I think I think that there is a uh, space for the paradox of um, individual collectivism. Mm -hmm. um, is I remember, I remember in high, I remember in high school, there were a bunch of people who would wear, who would wear that T-shirt that that said, "You laugh because I'm, I'm different. I laugh because they're all the same." And I'd see like four or five different people in in the span of <laughs> ten minutes wearing that exact same shirt. And I do think that's something that's rife for um, parodying, not not in, not in a cynical sense, but more in a, um, when you have, how how individual are. How individual do you have a bunch of people when they're um, being individually in the same in the same destination? Uh, for, I mean, to me, the difference is, I mean, it sounds kitschy, but like unity, not uniformity, right? Mm -hmm. Like if if being if belonging to the group means you have to talk and dress and think alike then that's basically just corporate shit, you know, writ small. Um, but if but if you belong to your people, no matter how you talk or, or act or think, um, then that sort of unity is actually very powerful uh, against the rest nice. of the world. So I, this is an interesting thing where, like, my particular brand of punk is is going to might shed a little light on this because like i was introduced to punk rock through rollerblading um and skating like aggressive skating and that was kind of the thing is like you you had to have a pair of skates or a skateboard and be willing to attempt what like you were you it didn't matter how much you talked about what you were doing doing was the only thing that mattered like i got acceptance whether i was wearing a super nerdy shirt and didn't have uh I, I could it didn't matter at all like i could skate and that was acceptable so they would start giving me things like off, uh, offspring albums when i was like 10 years old because like i could fit in with older kids and i i you know Fashion came as I was trying to define myself as a teenager, but really like the roots of where like, hey kid, you should listen to this Ramones album while we hit this rail was, was very simple. Like going over to my friend Josh's house and seeing like watching skate videos so we could learn to do tricks and they would be putting on you know, Henry Rollins style music and we'd be learning about what is DIY because like that was the thing and, and and there was an agreed upon choice like agreed upon rule that we essentially all rolled like whether it was a skateboard whether it was bmx whether it was skates like we all had to do it and you all had to pay tribute to a certain degree whether you're male female gay whatever you would be accepted if you could do a half pipe if you could it, it was a weird form of very awkward, very, very adolescent, uh, 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 like equality, <laughs> like very juvenile equality. Yeah, I can. It's definitely something I can. It's definitely something I can. Um, I can see, and um, that's that's all. That's also that's also why um. I find I find a I find a form of tr of true equality in in doing di in doing dice rolls at my table because it does it does not matter your orientation, gender, gender identity, ethnicity, 
height, weight, political affiliation, the dice gods hate you. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. They're, rails are rails, skates are skates. We love people who, it doesn't matter. Like, we, there, there are blind skateboarders and they're incredible. <laughs> like, I, I, it's just like anyone that's willing to put in the time, tall, small, whatever. You know, we, we enjoy it all. <laughs> I, tr I, tr I tried, but I ended up having a, um incident with a rail. Right, but that's a, this oh, is no. a very specific <laughs> subgroup of punk. Like, our punk didn't have the same racial tensions that a lot of other punk did. Or, you know, th this, this allowed our punk to be a little bit more universal in my spectrum of the world. Um, and in Dallas, Texas, in the early '90s, you know, this is this was our feel, you know, um, kind of in that expanse. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 not perfect in any way, shape, or, and it's definitely invented by ten-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when it comes when it comes to that, I always I always think of something Paula Schur once said. The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Well, and that's the thing is, I think that whether it's punk or not, there there is a show me, don't tell me attitude. Whether it's for us, it was skating. I think for a lot of punks, it's 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 being on stage Music, in yeah. some form or capacity. Um, whether they're good or not, you've got to get up there. But um, through, but through all, through all of that, um, <laughs> and we can't, we kind of dip, we kind of dipped into what the future might be. But there's, there's one sort of technology that's, cur that's um, and actually, I actually tell a lie. There's two sorts of technological um, things that have been talked about that are kind of bleeding edge. That I wonder if these things could be integrated into um, cyberpunk and. Some might argue one, one of these already is. The first one is the advent of nanotechnology. Mm. Mm. And I, I don't mean I don't mean into in into segueing that into the gray goose scenario, but <laughs> the I, the idea of adva of advancing na uh, nanotechnology to the point to the point where um like say the te the tech and the body are one are one and the same, kind of what kind of what was attempted with the neuromancer, but in a more reasonable fashion. The uh, the other and this is a concept that I I'd kind of known about, but I didn't know it in this term is the concept of metaverses. Uh -huh. Um. And I'm cur I'm curious what you what you all think about those particular concepts in terms of how they could be integrated within um, cyberpunk storytelling. I I can I can speak to the way that they haven't been, <laughs> or uh, like and I and I mean at near the end of fourth edition Shadowrun, nanotechnology was moving forward in the universe, mm -hmm. um, and it became. It became very clear that aesthetically, if nanotechnology moved any further or wasn't contained somehow, it would stop being cyberpunk and become something else, like a radical transhumanism. Now, I don't, I don't know that that um, necessarily stops it from being cyberpunk or necessarily, you know, means that it's stories that shouldn't be told. But it certainly would take the the aesthetic beyond uh, where Shadowrun wanted to be as far as the way it looked and the way it felt. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to tell those stories. Frankly, I don't know how to write those stories because I'm not smart enough to know what all the next steps are. <clears throat> you know, when, once we start opening up that uh, Pandora's box, right? Like, where does that go next? Who knows? How does it end? Who knows? Like, that, that stuff for people way smarter than me. So... Shadow Shadowrun made a purposeful, uh, like uh, meta narrative choice 
to downplay nanotechnology uh, with story reasons, you know, so that the classic 80s cyberpunk could remain uh, that same aesthetic. What a great example. Thank you for bringing that lore breakdown in. That's awesome. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, well, because I mean, you know, like like I said with earlier with punk, like now we're we're getting decades on punk, and so people have been doing this for a while. So we've got these examples where people have experimented with some of this stuff, and so like, um, and to me, and I think that's a really good example. Kind of my feelings about nanotech is because it's a it's an interesting Pandora's box, and I'd be curious about um, Mark's thoughts on this too, for sure, Cameron's as well. But um, but with Mark's thoughts, uh, um, kind of with some of the wider range of kind of what is cyberpunk, and because um, I'm sure there's some um, some things where they do dabble with nanotech and stuff oh, absolutely. like that. Absolutely, yeah. like Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age. Uses right. Yeah. Exactly. Route. And um, one of the one of the um, less um, memorable ways he uses, I guess, are the mediatronics. The sort of a uh, tattoos that change in Diamond Age uh, based on different conditions in a body. Right. Uh, they just recently put out an article that they're actually trying to make these tattoos now, and they're having a lot of success. Where yeah. you would have nano machines embedded into a tattoo. And then the tattoo would change colors based on whether you uh, were sick, whether you had a virus, nice. whether you had um, COVID, whether you were coming down with cancer. And they're actually, you know, making a lot of progress um, as far as embedding um, biometrics into the body where your um, skin would bio would change based on the biometrics um, mm -hmm. that you had, your heart rate, et cetera. Uh, the whole thing is a, is a transfer of the human being into something that can be infinitely quantified and measured and controlled essentially uh, re reducing the human being to a number in the sort of pursuit of perfection all transhumanism is based on the idea that we are inherently imperfect and that perfect simply means permanent Ooh. Mm. immortal so so again like with with what you just said like having uh changing colors based on you know whatever like that doesn't necessarily have to be a nanotech thing like we can do that not with nanotech but in that example, it sort of seems like anything a writer wants to do, they can just say, and it almost seems like nanotech is the new magic, right? Like oh, absolutely. whatever you want humans to be or to do or whatever story to plot device you want, you just say nanotech. And for the most part, most people don't know enough about it to argue, uh, you know, and, and I, I wonder if even if we do know, right, what's possible if, if all those things wouldn't be possible and nanotech is basically technological magic you know and that's kind of what i was I, I hate to say it like as an artist nanotech is so useless to me like i can't show it i can't draw it i can't like <laughs> photograph it it doesn't look good it's it's useless to me as an artist i can't represent it so i think it's a cool story element but like artistic but only with with frustrating right but only with fences around it right like if you have nanotech that can do X, Y, and Z, right, and it gives you a visual, then that's cool. But if you have, you know, nanotech that can just do whatever, <laughs> like, right? if I can't, it, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around what possible applications that would present without everybody just, I mean, like, literally not being human anymore. Like, what? Right. That's where nanotech gets into like a weird inner space variant for artists where it's no longer nanotech anymore because I'm having to show it to you visually. So like it sort of breaks the actual nanotechness of it like by showing you the size of or, or what it really is. Oh yeah. So, like oh, it's, yeah. it's almost yeah. from King Valley. I, from I had a I had an idea for a story um I used to run with a, a very conservative Christian crowd that was very hung up on controlling the sexuality of people. Right. Uh, and so <laughs> this idea of like it, the first thing that conservative uh, Christians might do with nanotech is make it so that you can't have sex. Right. Until, oh, until you reach a certain age or, or a certain thing happens or you get married or whatever. Right. Like that's they'll track it. Right. Like that's a story I can tell, but like, but I, in order to do that story, I would have to limit nanotech to only being that thing. Because if we can do that thing with nanotech, then surely we can do all sorts of other things. And I'm just not smart enough to build a world in which, you know in, in which I can uh, I can predict you know what that would look like. 
Yes, exactly. Right. And that is, um, you know, this is something that Cameron and I talked about explicitly at the early days of Axon Punk. And we still, um, uh, you know, it's still a, an expanding thing. Um, not, not to say it like sounds like a problem or whatever, but it's like, you know, how much nano punk, uh, how much nanotech is there in Axon Punk? Because we've got nanotech in 2020, we've had nanotech for decades, you know? And so like, what what degree you know what is our visual focus and things like that and so you know in our rule book we have some nanotech and um and it's it's cool and useful and things like that but we did make some aesthetic choices where we're going to focus more on like the wires as opposed to the bots i mean the microbots and things like that and um but i do think there absolutely is space but it does um you you said it well um that you know, if we can do A, then why can't we do B and C? Mm -hmm. um, is an often thing we get with nanotech. Um, you know, if we can do that, well, then we've cured cancer. Um, right. And what else? And what other non-intended consequences? I, again, I'm just not smart. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's just it's a Pandora's box. It is a Pandora's box that I am not. It's like the singularity. Like, we, we specifically put Axon Punk pre-singularity. They're all AI in Axon Punk is derived off of a human brain scan. AI do not create themselves organically. Um, because once because, you add AI and nanotech together, it doesn't <laughs> resemble anything like the reality that we are living in. <laughs> yes, no, once you give that, once you have, like, free range AI out there creating their own AI and self replicating with their own tech. Like, I don't even know what to do. I can't handle that as a GM, <laughs> which that, that kind of bring, that kind of brings me to the, to the concept of, um, met of metaverses, which comparatively, I think comparatively, I think, um, metaverses is is something that's a little bit more sane that we're that we're starting to, that we're starting to see and is one that i think won't be as useless to an artist as um nanotech is and this <laughs> in simple in simplest terms um metaverse is referred to as a collective virtual shared space um and some some argue that we're see, we're seeing um, the early ex, the early instances of this currently, and I'm cu I'm curious if um if you th now we can't we kind of that was something that was kind of predicted within Cyberpunk with the whole concept of the net as as it was seen, but something interesting has has potentially happened, where. Instead of seeing the instead of seeing this universal metaverse like we have with say the Matrix in um, Shadowrun, there's the possibility of seeing um, segmented metaverses, Al almost like almost like virtual states. I'm getting a I'm getting a Philip K. Dick vibe here. Are you, are, you, are you talking about when you say virtual states? Are you talking about like like virtual nations, like non geographic uh, citizenships and and allegiances or instances? Yeah, it was like, oh. what is defined as a microverse? Then, like, how much real estate are we talking? Or like, or no real estate, right? Or is that what you're saying? Right, like, is this like an AI conceptual thing? Like, no, not, not in ter not in terms of a not in terms of AI, but in ter in terms of um of con of convergence of of the, of virtual spaces, hmm. but like, I'm wondering how writ large are you going? Like, are you talking about post nationalism, like via the internet? Hmm. Um. <sighs> Or are you just talking about on a very micro scale where it's like me and my buddies in a chat room? Um, right in the middle. I'd cleave that right in the middle is is where I'm where I'm kind of shooting at with this. So like the, the sovereignty of cyberspace. I would, I guess like one potential way that I that I could that I could see this sort of thing and maybe and maybe this is something I'd write into a story itself. Um, 
of having two di- of having two different types of citizenship. The physical citizenship, i.e., the si- the citizenship of um, given na- given nations, cities, what have you, and the virtual citizenship, um, i.e., be i be considering yourself a citizen of a given virtual space. Yeah, I mean, I see. I'd be interested in. Uh, in rejection of physical nation-based citizenship in favor of... I mean, like, that's an interesting story from, that I would want to tell, right, as you're talking about this. Like, what does it mean to give up your citizenship based on geography and voluntarily give your citizenship to a community that doesn't exist based on the traditional things like uh, like blood or, um, you know, nationalism, etc.? That, that's a fascinating thing. I would I would like to mm-hmm. I would like to plumb that some more. Yeah, it's it's one it's um I'd say I'd say mm-hmm. we start I'd say I started seeing that seeing this phenomena of metaverses with the social aspects of MMORPGs. Mm. Um and I it's of course of course the big example of this is a is a lot of the social aspects that I saw with um World of Warcraft, which a lot of people looking at an outside in perspective don't quite realize how much of a game changer that specific game was. And within within because a lot, a lot of it did a lot of it especially at the tail end of of play does have a higher demand of socialization. The least of which being um, the co- the whole concept of doing raids, but oh, yes. I do think World of Warcraft is especially interesting socially because it does reflect a lot of what's going on in society. And I, I studied it a little bit. I don't know it that well, but because Colin and I were looking into uh, internet virus models, because there was like this spread of this crazy social. Oh yeah, the, vi- blood, the blood plague incident. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right? There's a blood plague thing, and it was so interesting how it mirrored reality. Like, it was so strange. You could yeah. probably explain it better than I can. Um, yeah, I, I can, because I, I was... I was that I was there when I was there when the whole thing went down and it was really on the front lines. It was there. <laughs> I do not have a thousand yard stare for the last friggin' time. <laughs> I have a ten thousand. I have a ten thousand yard stare because I had to read through the unholy trinity of bad RPGs. <laughs> Seriously, don't read World of Cinnabar if you value your sanity. Mm. Um, but what what ended this? It was a what ended up happening was there was a I forget the name of the raid boss, but there was a end game raid that was put out at a for a uh, brand new patch, and this. This boss had a debuff called Corrupted Blood. It would it would sap your health pretty pretty rapidly. But if and if you um walked by and if you walked by another um, player model, you could pass the you could pass Corrupted Blood onto them as well. What they di- what wasn't realized was that because of one little oversight, this th- this thing could also be applied to the pets that hunter classes would have. And the vector. And oh. they and they could be and they and they could carry it outside outside of the outside of the um, instance for this particular raid. That's when things went into full on meltdown. Because not o- because not only could it be carried by that, it could also be carried by say shopkeeps in town that would be asymptomatic. Oh wow! And so it ju- good. it just get it just. Get- they, I think they they tried to they tried to nuke the servers like three times to try and see if they could fix it. It di- it didn't work. You had people trying to you had people um, be acting as designated healers. There were skeletons all over the place, and there were some people who were trying to spread the thing intentionally, which was why yes. there was also um, there was also terrorism research a- in the aftermath of the whole thing. Yes. They tried to forcefully replicate this incident with um, the Rise of the Lich King expansion. It didn't work. <laughs> it it sank. It sank like a bag of rocks because lightning doesn't strike twice. 
that is so surreal. Wow. Except in real life. <laughs> I'd, I'd, um, I don't feel like bringing up that. I'm in a good mood right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, us I'm usually this, the, um, I'm usually it the avatar. It worked in World of, of Warcraft. Let's try it in real life. <laughs> Too much. Too soon. Too soon. And the uh, the the metaverse idea though is is very interesting, and um, to me it really reminds me of um, the three stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, um, mm -hmm. where they have like group hallucinations and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but that was like pre-internet. And that was before they had the ability of just like hopping in a chat room and, and living out fantasies and doing role plays and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and there is such a fascinating element of that on the internet um, that also ties into transhumanism and why I think this is really interesting in, in uh, the cyberpunk element because you can have different avatars, you can play in different spaces you know, people can have different Reddit accounts and suddenly like, you know, I, like one one day I am, you know, I am making helpful YouTube videos on how to uh, solve algebra problems on the other days they're dealing bad things on Silk Road, um, all in the same human. And um, and so I don't know if that ties into the, that that's what that kind of, reminds me of with this metaverse stuff is the research that I've done about like people on the dark, well, like people on the dark web and stuff like that. Um, people doing crime on the internet um, who have day jobs um, and things like that. And, um, you know, or people who in, in um, you know, different kind of communities. Um, sometimes they find wonderful things and sometimes they find nightmares. It's, it's a so, very cyberpunk. Yeah. So like is, is ready player one, is that cyberpunk? <gasps> Oh, <laughs> right. I mean, because that's that's essentially what we were just talking about. It has all the elements. So I would argue my personal definition. It is not cyberpunk. <clears throat> I would say that that is actually just science fiction, sure. in my opinion. And uh, specifically, like and this is where, like, I feel like cyberpunk doesn't really work as young adult fiction. Whereas, yeah. Yeah. see, like, this is Ready Player One is young adult fiction. Though we yeah. read uh, young adult, adult fiction, you know, we read Cyberpunk when we were young adults. I don't think it's designed for us. So, so say, say if, you could, if you could distill why. Is it because it doesn't present the harsh realities that mm. would be present in that sort of society? Or is there some other... So for me, excellent question, and I've thought about this one, and because um, this comes up a lot, because it's a it's a beloved book, and I, I still haven't seen the movie yet, and people say the movie is even better than the book. I don't, um, I didn't think so. But go ahead. <laughs> so, I don't know, that's just what I've been told. I've heard mixed things either way, but um, but to distill it for me um, goes back to the DIY um, kind of idea of, of progress and trying to do things better. And to me, for Ready Player One, they're doing things not to do something better, but they're 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 doing these things because they are the things that should be done, um, or whatever. And so, like, you're playing Joust not because Joust is a good game, and my this, this was my takeaway of it, but it's because it, or maybe I don't know, it has a romanticism, you're like in a it. reaching back, right? A nostalgia yeah. instead a nostalgia of a moving in forward it. and through, right? Something. Like, I'm not playing this game because it's the best game, it's because I'm playing this game be because it's what I played when I was 13, or because some rich guy hung a you know a, yeah. a bobble out in front of me and said, I have to, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, and so, like, you know, and it's and how and is it's that different in, in, in real, in real, yeah, how is that different than case? Right, <laughs> like, exactly like, right. And yeah, yeah. Then I think that's a good question, right? And so to me, it's the question of of progress. Um, is because uh, Case is using a bra a, a brawn coffee maker is because that's the coffee that gets the best code out of him, and um, as opposed to um, watching Monty Python, 
it's yes, hell yeah, it's a great movie, but like we can do better comedy and like, yes, we should always keep it on the shelf, but like, let's maybe not romanticize it to the point that it's, we neglect progress. Like to me, there's not, it gets to the point where we stop making progress. And that's why I don't think Ready that's, Player One is punk it's anymore. It's nostalgia, right? It's yeah, just it's looking just back instead of looking ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also I feel like Ready Player One is very much on rails um, as a narrative. It is very much, you know what you're getting as you sign up, as I, I felt. Like I'm getting a very hero's tale. Sure, yeah. Like, like things are going to work out in the end. Yes, it's yeah. very, you know, like Joseph Campbell. It is very formulaic. So it's got aesthetics of cyberpunk, right? Like we were talking yeah, about before. It, it doesn't actually, it doesn't, there's no social commentary that you're going to take away from that other than, wow, that's a vaguely possible future. Yeah. Yes, Sadly, yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is fun and interesting, but, and I, I'm a nostalgia person. I will get down on my Street Fighter 2 Turbo. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? I'm I'm that poster child. I'm the person they're advertising to. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. You're, so and when you're it falls the person on I'd, my have to, I'd make drink the pain glass when you end up abusing Balrog. Right? Yeah, and that's uh, the thing. I'm a Ken guy, like, for sure. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's why I think it, Ready Player One is so young adult fiction because I don't think it resonates for someone like me because I was there. And I think that like for like my 18 or like 20 something year old friend, they find it more interesting because it like... Oh, Hunger Games then, right? That's young right? adult. And yeah. it kind of only vaguely works out in the end. And only on a personal level. Right, very much so, and I, you know, and that goes back to like there's hunger games, which I like better, we, by the way, than Ready Player One. Um, yeah, and that k kicks into um, that being like because that goes into what is Japanese, like that goes into a whole like the Bushido Code circle. Because when you're talking about Hunger Games, that's inspired by Battle Royale, which is the Japanese like movie about taking a bunch of children to like disposable children to a village and having them kill each other and only one surviving because they're like delinquents. And that was originally a very like, way of, of scapegoating, right? Like, and, and having the country's or the community's violence explored by other people so that the rest of the community can remain safe uh, and, and not participate in it. Well, right. The funny thing, the funny thing about a concept like scapegoating is its origins, which I think I think have been lost in translation over the years. Hmm. Um, as I was taught it, the idea of the idea of scapegoating is you pile the sins of a of a tribe onto a goat, you send that goat out into the wilderness where it will presumably die of thirst and hunger, and you've presumably absolved the community of their own sins. And yes, but maybe what you don't know is that they actually had to make sure that they sent somebody after the goat to kill it because it would often wander back into the community, causing a lot of disruption and question about whether or not God actually forgave them or not. I'd, but like, say, I'd say that's a pretty fitting metaphor. Like, <laughs> right, but like the, the whole thing is like regardless of what it, it was supposed to do theologically, on a community basis, what it was actually doing was allowing people to participate in violence against an innocent so that the community itself could sort of discharge their violence. And then regardless of whether or not you want to use that word scapegoat, right? That 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 phenomenon happens all over the place in every culture, right? Where you have an outcast group that you pour all of your hatred into so that the normal and polite society doesn't tear each other apart with their own squabbling. Mm -hmm. But with the so that was what I was that's what I was saying with the yeah. with the Hunger Games type thing, right? Is like you have this, you know, culturally accepted violence where everybody can sort of pour their their violent tendencies into, you know, like rooting for their side, and then once mm -hmm. it's done, we can all pretend like our violent we're like we're not the violent ones. Yeah. Um. But I think I think that I think I think e I think either way. Whether whether for better or worse, the future of the of the concept of of cyberpunk, whether it be whether it be games or in um, other mediums, is certainly going to prove to be interesting in the coming years. And I think that I think that's 
as good as good a spot as any to um to co to call it. Um, with that with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank all, all four of you for taking the time out of your respective schedules and braving the hell that is time zone management to <laughs> to come to come into the temple. And of course, anytime any of you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, thank you for having me, man. Like, I, I really feel like I'm outclassed by, by these other folks. And so thank you guys mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. being here oh. and uh, the great conversation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear more from Mark because every time he opened his mouth, I was like, wow, this guy's really smart. <laughs> so it's been an Mark honor and a pleasure office. to be here and an honor to speak to you all. Yes. Thank you, guys. Yeah. And, of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until Absolutely. then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>